He's responsible for the characters to come alive in the successful How to Train Your Dragon movies. We get a chance to speak to the Swiss living the American dream, Simon Otto. He made a career at Hollywood DreamWorks Studios, where he ended up as head of character animation. And now, after 21 years, he decided to leave the studio. In this interview, he tells us why. You're from the small town of Gomiswald and you made it to Hollywood. That's incredible. It is. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very unique career path and I'm very happy I was able to, to do it. Are you aware of that? I mean, I guess people react a lot to it. I mean, I'm aware of it when I come to Switzerland. Of course, uh, in Los Angeles, I'm surrounded by people who have a very similar path, you know, uh, which is interesting when you come into a job that not a lot of people do. Little by little, you're, you get surrounded by thinkalikes and people who have very similar uh, histories, but they come from Denmark, from France, from Canada, or from South America, or wherever. And, uh, and so in, in that sense, I'm not reminded of it every day in my regular life, but I'm very much aware that I do a job that's very rare and that very few people have the, you know, the, the luck to do because it's very competitive and in order to get in you have to you know, display a lot of skills and, and also have had luck along the way to get there. So you had to work hard? For sure. I mean, uh, I think first and foremost it's passion. It's be, being really passionate about something from a very early age on. Uh, I think in that sense it's similar to being an athlete or uh, an artist in other fields or an actor. It's you have to really live it, you know, and you have to want to do it every day, you have to want to get up. So I, I drew from a very early age on, from as a young kid, I wanted to draw every day. And I dreamt of being an animator you as, did? Uh, since, I, since I was like, you know, 10, 12 years old. But then you first did a banking apprenticeship, is that true? Yeah, like a good Swiss, you know. I went down the wrong path. I knew very quickly that that's not what I was wanting, what I wanted to do all my life because I just, I just, it just wasn't for me and I felt like an artist. And, but what it did for me was it, it gave me focus. It made me realize that if I really wanted to do this for real, that I had to focus on it and, and not, uh, you know, go down the wrong path. And so when I finished my banking apprenticeship, I knew now is my chance. Now I have a diploma. I've, I can always fall back to doing this. And that, that was basically what pushed me to do it. That's actually really very Swiss. <laughs> to have something secure yeah, first. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but what triggered you then to, to, to go into the creative sector? Was it some, a moment or...? Yeah, after... My, I mean, I, again, I drew all the time, so I, I always thought that at some point I would try uh, to get into art school. But during my military service, um, I met uh, somebody who um, worked for a company that did snow sculptures for the big ski resorts. And I thought, well, that sounds great. And he invited me to participate in one. And then very quickly, I, I basically did it for an entire year. And I became a project leader of uh, Arosa, of a town, I mean, to do snow sculptures for Arosa, uh, which was amazing, very cold. And I, you know, I froze a lot. I mean, it was really cold a lot. But um, uh, I, uh, that allowed me then to get into art school. and. From that point forward, having snow sculptures in my portfolio was always like very impressive to people because like in Paris they went like, this guy does snow sculptures, that's you know, unusual. So I think it gave me a little bit of a sort of a odd bird bonus that, that helped me along the way. So you mentioned Paris there, you studied at the renowned Parisian Les Gobelins animation school and I read that you said that you really had to work hard to compete against the French and the Belgium art students. How did that manif manifest itself? Tell us of this hard work. Well, when I got in with my portfolio of snow sculptures and all sorts of odd things, even though I had a lot of drawings in there, I recognized that my culturally in Switzerland, in terms of comic books and animation, you grow up with a fairly limited view on what that world could be. And I don't know if you've ever had a chance to walk into a comic book store, a bookstore period in France. It's I mean, huge, the, 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 the variety of types of draftsmen that there are. And in that school, it was a very competitive school. It was like 900 applicants to, for 20 spots, and I made it in. Those, those students, my co-students, were incredibly talented. So incredible draftsmen who had 
a much greater uh, skill set than I had. So I, the advantage was I was a foreigner in Paris and all I did was draw and try and catch up. And, and I think I did eventually, be, with the help of all my co-students, the level was like I was, I was getting better so fast. And then by the beginning of the second school year, I actually got, a, I got an offer from DreamWorks to go work in Hollywood. Was able to finish my year, but got hired straight out of school. That's crazy. That was before you even had your diploma. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Did they see your work or did no, you apply for it? I, I mean, it's, it was a, a moment in time where the gates opened because uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the head of Disney or Disney Animation, he uh, left Disney to create a new company called DreamWorks uh, with Sp Steven Spielberg and David Geffen, and they needed animators. And so uh, they brought an entire studio from London that was working on movies like Balto or uh, Five All Goes West and all these really big animated movies in London. The entire team from London went to LA, created DreamWorks, they brought in some Disney animators, and most of those animators were French, or a lot of them were French. And they said, well, that school in Paris has an, has an amazing array of talent. So me and two of my, my friends from school actually got hired to join that team and work on the Prince of Egypt. So you would say you were also at the right time, at the right spot? Absolutely. I, I completely, I, I just, you know, was one of those kids who, uh, who just, you know, really took, had a chance to take advantage of that boom in animation in the late 90s. So you mentioned Steven Spielberg, who co-founded DreamWorks. Did you have a relationship with him? Anything that you learned from him? I mean, I, not directly. I mean, I've uh, I've met him and I've seen him, but it's not like he would point me out in the crowd. But uh, my relationship was mostly with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who uh, who ran the studio. But Steven Spielberg would come in on every movie, and he would watch the movie with us, and we would sit in the theater, and then he would give us comments and feedback and and uh, was very influenced to this day, even How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, is, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg read the script. He, he really loves the franchise, and, uh, and Dean DeBrod, the director, who's here as well, he um, uh, has a, a close relationship with him. So they, they worked on the script, I mean, worked together. He gave him feedback on it and, and pointed out some really important story points. So that's why you're here right now to promote the new How to Train Your Dragon a Hidden World movie, which is the last one of the trilogy. Um, and you were responsible for the two main uh, dragons. Another night fury. But I ain't got weeks. It's more like a bright A fury. light fury. Yeah, yours is better, probably. <laughs> There are around, I don't know, 45 animators who work on that. How do you make sure that they always look more or less the same? So my job as a head of character animation, I'm, in, I'm a lead animator, basically. I'm, I oversee the entire department, but I'm also, in a way, responsible for everything that uh, relates to the characters. So I start in the design phase, and then we build these digital puppets, if you will, uh, for about a year and a half, and then uh, it's time. Once it's time to start shot production, uh, once these characters are ready, we um, we then work with a growing number of animators as we go through production. So the way it's structured is uh, every character has a supervising animator, every main character, and uh, it's their job to make sure that the character is is sort of always animated the same way and they have very strong opinions about how these characters should be animated. And it's my job to make sure that the right animators work on the right shots and that uh, you, they don't sort of outdo each other in a shot. And uh, so I'm kind of overseeing, making sure that every shot um, works the best way possible. So it's, it's a trick of, of the trade to figure out how does Toothless move uh, differently from the Light Fury, for example, or how does hiccup move differently from Astrid. So that, that's, that's a, it's a, you know, we give ourselves some rules and we look at references. We do a lot of research in how do these different characters behave, you know, uh, and we study the actors too. They are a great influence in how, how we perform the characters. So as a head of 
character animate animation what else is is your um role is it also checking you know that everything is done within a certain time because i i guess it's also you know tied to a certain budget yeah well yeah for sure i mean there's a lot of leadership um, uh, things that come along with this position you know like scheduling out how long it would take to do a certain sequence and um, but I, i usually work with production personnel like uh, from producer to production managers and And we together figure out, like, I tell them creatively, this is what we need. And they say, well, you have this much time, so maybe you have to put more animators on the shot. Or So we, we talk a lot about that. But my job is a creative job. Like, I, I, I definitely work a lot on how the shots get performed and what makes the scenes entertaining. So that, that's re it's, it's a mixture of both, but it's mostly creative. Okay. And what... I guess you also mentioned leadership. Um, what makes a good team work with so many people? I mean, the, 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 the challenging part is to keep artists motivated and focused. So, in the, in, in, and the way you do that is you make sure that they own their own arts, that they feel ownership over what they do. So you have to give them a chance to express themselves as artists, to be you know, to be able to play a scene the way they feel it, the way they think it's the most entertaining. That's why they got hired from around the world to do this job in the first place. So I think my job is not to get in the way and tell them exactly this is how it's supposed to be. My job is to, to help them not fall off the track and say, so it's a little bit of a, we call this a bit of a leadership with improv. It's an improv exercise, which improv in, in performance means You never say no, you always say yes, but could it also be this way? What if we tried it this way? Do you think you would like it just as much? So there's techniques in which you can keep animators engaged. And the most important thing is you do a lot of conversations up front. Like with the director, you work on what the scene's about, you know, what do we want out of it in the beginning? And you do a, you have a lot of conversations like that. I think that that probably goes for every kind of leadership. You want to make sure that in the end you don't have to tell somebody how to do something, but you take their ideas and you guide it in the in the direction and and also make sure they don't, you know, spend days and days on the wrong thing that just will not work. So It's a lot of conversations up front, but it's also a lot of um, keeping people motivated and keeping people feel like it's their, it's their thing, it's something they own. That's very, very important, I think. Then I read at, in NZZ you once said the production of an animation movie requires a lot of work, up to four years. Considering that, you can't move too far away from the mainstream as a big audience is, a, is required. Yeah. So I guess you're also aware that your product needs to serve a big mass? Absolutely. I mean, we try, to, we try to forget about it because ultimately what we all have, uh, I think, as animators is we have a childhood dream in our heads, which is as a young kid, as, even as a 10-year-old boy, I loved a certain type of animation. I loved the Jungle Book. I loved the Aristocats. I loved the old Disney movies. And what they did very well is they gave you a character, a characterization. They, they made something very entertaining and it was accessible to me. I think what we, what we try to do is we try to make films that we love ourselves and that satisfies that childhood dream that we, we all had. So we kind of naturally fall into that, uh, into that part. We call it a kind of four quadrant films, right? They, they're entertaining for young kids, they're entertaining for adults, Parents get uh, sort of the meta humor that plays on multiple levels. And we try to satisfy every, every, every one of our clients, essentially, every one of our, our uh, moviegoers by making it entertaining for them. And I guess that works very well with, um, with How to Train Your Dragon. It's actually the flagship movie of DreamWorks, right? It's definitely one of the projects that every, every artist at DreamWorks wants to work on. And do you feel then more pressure, let's say, with the third movie now? Because, you know, you already set the bar so high and it, already, it also made millions of, uh, you know, um, yeah. dollars as well to, to keep that bar so high. I mean, the, the pressure's from oursel for our, ourselves, right? So it's a very rare opportunity to do a trilogy in animation 
and do it with the same crew, the same director, the same writer, the same production designer and, and, and all the artists behind it. It's basically the same team. And it, it was a, always our goal that if we do more than one movie, that we do a trilogy that closes itself, that ends with a conclusion that gives us the arc of, the, of this character. And that these three movies can be watched basically strung together and you never feel like, oh, well, that felt different. And uh, there's few movies that have achieved that. So that was always our goal. So that pressure came from within. It was less a business pressure, uh, particularly for, for, for me as an artist. And I know that the directors uh, and the producers feel the same way. Uh, of course, a studio probably looks at it from a different point of view. They want to make sure that, uh, that it continues the franchise because there's a television show, there's a lot of consumer products and, and, and toys and games that go with it. So there's a business uh, interest behind it. Uh, we never talked about this uh, as with the studio in terms of, I must make this much money, it must be this successful. The goal was always maintain the, the quality standard and tell a story that's really engaging to our audience and everything else will follow. So we really focus on that. That's, that's our main goal. Okay. Then uh, a few years ago, 2014 to 17, DreamWorks had some problems. Um, they had a few flops. Uh, Turbo, Rise of the Guardians, where, that lost a, a few million dollars as well. And they also had to lay off 500 workers, including people within the animation division, and reduce the amount of movies released from three to two. And I was wondering, you were there at the time, how did you experience this? I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking to see people lose their jobs. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's restructuring, a constant restructuring. I think the appetite of Hollywood studios is always bigger and bigger and bigger and, and go like make as much product as we can and then eventually there's a cycle right where where the audience pushes back on that maybe this is not exactly the I mean it is a hit and miss business I mean live action and animation not every movie is going to be successful and the, and the big studios know that so the bigger the output the more likely they'll have hits and and they can cover for the for the misses in this case, I, I mean, I've always been in the How to Train Your Dragon bubble for the last 12 years, and that's always been constant, and I've worked with the same people, so it didn't, other than, you know, seeing people lose their jobs and, and we closed uh, the studio in San Francisco, it never directly affected me, and, uh, but, but it has happened at Disney, it has happened at DreamWorks, you know, I've gone through... Um, cycles in animation where we've gone from hand-drawn animation to computer-generated animation. That was a very tricky phase because now you not only, maybe a movie wasn't successful, but you have to actually change crafts. You have to go from working with a, with a pencil and paper to a computer-animated movie. So you, you change the way you work, that's, 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 um, that's tricky. But I always believe that positivity floats up. So if you, if you engage in these changes in a positive way and you embrace it, you come out on top in the long run. But How to Train Your Dragon, Hidden World was supposed to be released earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Was this the reason why it, it took so long? Partially, yeah. I think because we had some uh, changes in the leadership structure at DreamWorks, this gives you a little bit of a pushback. But mostly the, um, the reasons for that was, were creative. Like, let's give this movie some time. Let's make sure that we do this right. And, uh, and we just wanted to make sure that this movie can live up to its, its predecessors. <laughs> so how does a studio nowadays make money? So I guess with, with How to Train Your Dragon, you have this brand, as you mentioned. They have a TV series, mm -hmm. Dragons, right? Um, I also saw that there's a cooperation between DreamWorks and Netflix. Mm -hmm. Also for dragons, yeah. is that the way to go? That um, you create, let's say, short uh, movies for streaming platforms while having uh, movies in the in the cinema. I mean, the most successful animated franchises have always not only made movies, but then spin-off TV shows or video games or or, or toys. 
And I think every big company does that. And it's usually a sign that there's an audience out there, that, that, that the characters are beloved, which for me is amazing. You know, that's, that's very rewarding. And I actually ended up directing some episodes for the television show, which was very, very, very fun. And, uh, and then you try to find the best platforms to do that with. You know, sometimes it's a, a, a regular TV channel or sometimes it's Netflix or streaming services. And that's definitely the boom in the animation industry right now. There's all these streaming services that are want to engage the family audience and therefore animation has become a really important part of their business plan. So I was wondering, Hollywood somehow nowadays can't really survive without Netflix and HBO. This is a must. I mean, it's a, it, it's a must. It, I think streaming services are a must. Like, I think the audience now is engaging with uh, content in different ways. There's still, I mean, the theater is still a really important part of getting a movie launched and getting a movie seen because it's an experience that you share with sometimes hundreds of people. And that is a different experience than watching it on, on your television at home, even if you have the best setup at home. Watching a comedy with uh, you know hundred other people that laugh along with you has a different effect on you, and also it's a really important launching pad for a lot of these movies because it's a great marketing campaign also for this movie to then do well on whatever platform it might be. But but I think it was always important for Hollywood to listen to what the audience wants and where they want to com consume their uh, entertainment and how, whether it's games or, or streaming. And I think that's, that's really important that we pay attention to that. And it, it's clearly the model is shifting a great deal. And I think it, it sends shockwaves through the big studios because everybody's now trying to see how do they deal with uh, the success of, of, of uh, you know, Netflix and Amazon and all these places. And uh, so all the big studios have announced their own streaming services because they want to make sure that their content gets seen, but that they can also, you know, be profitable in that in that new environment then you were 20 oh, so far it's 21 years that you were in Hollywood what were the biggest disruptors within that time you mentioned the drawing by hand to computer based drawing that's for sure for me personally that was the biggest shift right to go from a pencil to a mouse and back then the, the technology was much more um, challenging because the, the images weren't produced as fast, like the computers ha didn't have the speed to carry the, the richness and, the, and the, the complexity that like How to Train the Dragon the Hidden World has. You know, it's so rich now, we can do basically whatever we can imagine, we can do it. Technology allows us to do it and it allows us to do it fast. We can reiterate, we can try, we can play with this. So I think for the industry as such, um, the, com the, the arrival of computer animation was huge. I mean. At first it started small, but now, by now, it's, it's, it's unthinkable uh, that there would be an animation industry without the support of computer animation. Uh, so that was definitely the biggest, the biggest shift. One more question. Uh, I read that you somehow left DreamWorks now uh, to pursue private goals. What are your plans? So I, I left DreamWorks just because I needed to take a break. I've, I've been on How to Train a Dragon for 12 years. And I just wanted to like sort of take a moment and think about you know what I want to do with my life. Uh, I want to continue to be in animation. Now I'd like to become a director. So right now I'm working on multiple projects in development, and uh, it's very possible that I uh, I'll stay at DreamWorks and continue those projects there. So I'm having conversations with a lot of people, but mostly I'm sleeping to recover from the hard work from How to Train a Dragon three. <laughs> Great, then I wish you all the best with your future projects and thank you so much. Thank you so much, appreciate it.